Hello and welcome to the Treatment Free Beekeeping Podcast. Today on the podcast, I have Dr. Leo Sharashkin from Missouri. He is at horizontalhives.com, so if you want to go ahead and pull that up, you can f- kind of follow along. Uh, let's get it started. Leo, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining us today. It's my pleasure, to Solomon. Leo was another guest that I've had that I really know nothing about. I've just you know looked at his website really quickly, uh, but who was suggested to me by one of the users of the Facebook group. So, Leo, why don't you go ahead and kind of give us an introduction to um, what you do and... Uh, your specialties and your your uh, your pet projects, things like that. Thank you, Salman. Uh, my name is Dr. Leo Sharashkin, and my website is horizontalhive.com. I was born and raised in Russia, and my uncle uh, has been keeping bees uh, treatment-free since 1972, even before I was born. So I was spending summers uh, uh, at his farm in his village, uh, seeing how he manages the bees. And after coming here to the U.S., sir, I got my master's degree in natural resources from Indiana University and a PhD in forestry from the uh, University of Missouri. Uh, we bought a farm in the middle of the woods in the Ozarks and started keeping our bees, too. And I wanted to follow uh, this tradition of keeping bees naturally and treatment-free. I now have uh, 30 hives that were never ever treated, not only with chemicals, but not even with their uh, organic treatments. And uh, I catch feral swarms. This is the only way I replenish uh, my apiary and uh, have great success with that. Uh, also, I served as editor of the English version of the natural beekeeping book called Keeping Bees with a Smile, a vision and practice of natural apiculture. This is Russia's number one best-selling book on natural beekeeping, and when I read it in the original Russian language, I was so much impressed with how clearly the practical uh, treatment-free beekeeping now, principles were presented there that I arranged the translation of this book uh, here so you can uh, get it from horizontalhive.com or from any other source. One other thing apart from keeping my bees uh, treatment free and only sourcing them from the feral wilder uh, stock uh, of survivor bees here in the Ozark wilderness is that I only utilize horizontal hives. Uh, most people are not really aware of them with the exception of top bar hives, but there is a long tradition in Europe and Eastern Europe and Russia of uh, using hives that are expanded horizontally rather than vertically. It offers many advantages. One clearest example is that you never have to lift any heavy weights, which makes the horizontal hives uh, that have all the frames uh, on one level accessible to virtually everyone. So this is in a nutshell what I'm doing, and I'm enjoying it tremendously. Uh, I would say that keeping bees with a smile is exactly that. It's not just about the bees and having them healthy and they're uh, productive, but it's also about the smile, because it's been giving me a great joy to see that today, just as 100 years ago, you can still keep bees naturally with interfering in their lives as little as possible, and still get the reward of wax, honey, and other wonderful products. So I'm looking at your website here, and you have plans for your hives. I do. I have free plans for all hive models that I use are available on the Internet. Uh, And I use different models. Some of them use the regular Langstroth frames um, that are just arranged in one long box that can hold up to 30 frames. I always build my hives are either of very thick board, like two by lumber, that is one and a half inch thick, to give them better protection from uh, the extremes of temperature and fluctuations of temperature. 
And uh, I personally favor the European size of the frame uh, called the Layens frame, uh, which is 13 uh, inches long by 16 inches deep. And this arrangement of the comb was traditionally used in Europe for successful overwintering, even in the very harsh climates, because it allows you to have uninterrupted brood nest and bees have access to honey on this very deep frame uh, without having to bridge the gap between the two boxes as in a conventional Langstroth hive system. Yeah, I'm looking at a picture here. The For those of you that haven't yet gone and looked at the website, definitely go and see that because the way the frames are laid out is they are uh, not as long as Langstroth frames and much deeper, and they have vertical wires rather than horizontal. The hives, as he mentioned, are built of thicker wood and... Um, Looks like you have to layer two boards together, I'm guessing, because you don't find boards that are yes. that tall. You can either use the boards that are, uh, already have tongue and grooves cut in them that are used for flooring, making the subfloor, mm -hmm. uh, or you can just cut uh, uh, the tongue and groove connection yourself and connect two 2x10 two boards together to make this deeper box. I see. And also, I'd like to mention that this Layens hive model is not something new. It was invented back in the 19th century in France uh, by Georges de Layens, the most prominent beekeeper uh, in his time. And there, uh, today, in Europe, there is over one million hives of the, uh, this horizontal Layens hive model still in use. So it's been thoroughly tested in practice. And that does offer many of the advantages. You know, one other aspect that I like about horizontal hives, other than not having to lift anything, other than one frame full of honey, is the fact that there are no supers to put on top of this box. And because of that, you can make the top bars that touch. There is no gap between the top bars. Uh, because the initial logic behind having the top bars are with their half-inch spacing between them was to allow the bees to go into the supers. Here, there are no supers. The top bars touch similarly to the top bar hive. So when you open the horizontal hive, you really do not disturb the whole colony because you see this ceiling formed by the top bars and you are able to do what you need to do, for example, adding more frames on the side or pulling some frames uh, with honey on the side of the hive without ever having to break into the brew chamber. What other, um, what other comparisons can you make with um, Langstroth hives? Because the vast majority of beekeepers in the U.S. use Langstroth hives and even in many other places around the world? Yes, yeah, Solomon, I would say it really depends on your climate. Even Langstroth himself, if you open the first edition of his book, was saying that thin-walled hives are not appropriate in almost any climate, either anywhere where winter can be cold or anywhere where summers can be very hot. Because most of this country has their, you know, climates that are either hot in the summer or cold in the winter, or both. Langstroth himself was not advocating the use of the hives that we call Langstroth today. In fact, if you look up his hive that he developed, that was the real original Langstroth hive, you will see that he proposed a model that was built out of uh, uh, boards and out of glass, but it had double walls with a pocket of air between the walls that for the winter was filled with their straw or other insulation material. Uh, of course, these hives were much more bulky than the Langstroth hives we have today, but they did have the advantage of mitigating the extremes of temperature and were offering the bees the kind of home that mimics to a great extent uh, their natural habitat, the tree hollow, where normally they would have several inches of uh, wood material on all sides of their nest, protecting them from the fluctuations of temperature. 
which are, can be very detrimental to their buildup in the spring and survival of the brood in the spring and also to their well-being in the summer and in the winter. So drawing the comparison between the horizontal hives and the Langstroth hives we use today, I would say that this insulation is a, uh, a very big difference, but it is actually, ironically, with their in the keeping with the original design by Langstroth and he is a uh, very persistent uh, position that you do need to protect the bees from the extreme of temperature the same way as they are protected in a tree hollow. Uh, also, uh, uh, another aspect of the horizontal hive beekeeping is that it doesn't have to be managed as uh, intensively as the uh, vertical stacked hive. Now let me give you one example. In a Langstroth hive, we need to control the volume of the hive ourselves. Uh, say you overwintered the colony in two boxes. Then in the spring, you need to add the super to increase the hive volume. And uh, if you do it too early, it's not very good for the colony because the warm air rises into the super increasing the chance of them chilling the brood and developing all kinds of infectious diseases including even full brood or uh, chalk brood. So you can chill the brood if you add your super too early, especially in the climate that can still have chilly or even freezing cold nights during the spring. If you add your super too late, then uh, the bees may run out of room and start swarming um, just due to congestion and lack of room for expansion. The horizontal hive, in comparison, is much more forgiving, especially for beginner beekeepers, because instead of you having to modify the volume of the hive constantly throughout the season, which takes practice and there quite a bit of skill and knowledge, uh, the hive is more self-regulated. The bees have the entire volume of the box, say it can be 30, deep Langstroth frames or, or it can be 14 or 20 Layens frames or, that are larger. They're not as long as Langstroth but they are deeper. Anyway, so you put the frames in there in the spring after their spring inspection and you allow the bees to expand their brood nest and then expand into the storage section of the hive without you having to be there to do it for them. The strong colonies will expand faster, the weaker colonies will expand more slowly, but in each case, each colony will decide themselves at what rate they want to absorb these additional frames and expand. So it is more self-regulating and there not only the mistakes are not as costly as in the Langstroth model, but also you are not required to be there checking bees, adding supers, etc., doing other things like swarm control. Uh, you don't need to do it regularly. Um, the book itself uh, that Layens wrote based on 35 years of experience with horizontal hives uh, describes that basically this was the model that was designed for remote out yards where you can only get to infrequently and there you get there in the spring and you check the um, brood chamber for the presence of brood to assess the quality of the queen. If everything is okay, you fill the whole box with frames and you leave them until September when the time comes to uh, harvest honey. So basically two visits per year is what was the norm managing horizontal hives. And of course, this would be very challenging to do efficiently in a Langstroth hive. So this is the hive model so, uh, that is very gentle on the bees, but also very gentle and forgiving for the beekeeper, especially the beginning beekeeper. One more aspect about horizontal hives that makes them quite different from uh, our conventional stacked hives, you don't need to use a queen excluder in a horizontal hive. Uh, the thing is that even in the time of ancient Egypt, uh, beekeepers already knew that if you use a horizontal hive layout and the first hives known to humanity in ancient Egypt were horizontal, they knew back then already 
that in a horizontal hive the brood will stay by the open entrance and honey will be stored in the back of the hive the same way as it is being stored in the supers in a vertically stacked hive. So what it does is, again, you don't need to control the volume of the brood chamber yourself by inserting a queen excluder at some point. Uh, the weak colony may utilize only five or six frames for their brood area and use the rest for honey. The stronger colony can utilize up to 10 frames for their brood or even more, but there, there will be a sharp uh, boundary between their brood chamber and their honey stored away from the open entrance. So you open the hive and you start harvesting frames from the end that is opposite the end of the um, uh, open entrance and you will be getting frames that are honey frames without any presence of brood, uh, not because there was a queen excluder, but because you know this natural principle that in a horizontally extended hive, the bees are stay close to the entrance to have their brood nest, because this is where it's easy to ventilate it and to lower the CO2 concentration to the acceptable level. This is where pollen and nectar come from to feed the brood. And there, the queen will not scatter brood over the entire volume of the hive, even in the absence of queen excluder, because they do want to have uh, a compact uh, brood chamber, brood nest, that would be easy to ventilate, heat, and cool in the summer. Pretty excellent explanation there. That's a lot of really good information. Uh, I would definitely recommend for anybody listening to this, go to the website and kind of follow along with what he's talking about here and look at some of the pictures because I'm looking at them right now and um, I can really see what he's talking about. It helps. I'm a, I'm a visual learner, so that really helps me. Mm -hmm. So you're located, according to your website, in Ava, Missouri? And this is correct. This is the south central part of Missouri uh, in the middle of the Ozark Mountains. And this is... Uh, one of these beautiful natural areas where you can still practice natural beekeeping quite successfully um, because the uh, woods are full of trees with hollows that can provide bee habitat and because there, there is the survivor uh, wild population in the wild uh, that through natural selection had acquired a remarkable uh, resistance to varroa and other diseases that become our a major problem in managed apiaries. For example, of the swarms that I caught uh, uh, four years ago in swarm traps located away from anybody else's apiary out in the wild, so I know that it's coming from wild feral bees rather than from managed colonies. So even of the swarms that were caught four years ago in 2013, 80% are still going after four years without any treatments whatsoever. My survival rates are, are usually above 90% each winter. This past winter I lost one colony out of 20 uh, and again this is uh, without any treatments. I don't think that anyone would be able to practice natural beekeeping successfully because ultimately the success depends not on the hive model you use but where your stock comes from. Tom Seeley from uh, Cornell University, author of Honey Bee Democracy and other wonderful books, has been making experiments and doing a lot of research on feral bees uh, in uh, the wilderness of uh, their forests in upstate New York. And he is seeing the same thing there, that the bees that escaped our care and were not mm, treated against varroa mites managed to survive, the population crashed, but a handful of colonies who are naturally resistant to varroa survived and they persist to this day, they multiplied, so the whole population of wild bees now is at the same level as back in the 70s or 80s before varroa mites arrived because they are entirely composed by now of feral stock. And because I am blessed with being in a place where there is this very stronger 
uh, feral population of uh, bees. I can bees, keep bees naturally and they're combining this very robust uh, strong feral stock uh, with uh, the hive models that are well insulated, require little maintenance and also provide for really natural low disturbance style of beekeeping uh, leads to a result where you can really attend to many other matters or, and only visit your hives occasionally. You certainly don't have to manage them in the sense that we are familiar with uh, when we talk about uh, uh, Langstroth hives. So I'm guessing you don't do any sort of manipulation or anything to try and control swarming? Uh, I don't because for me a swarm is uh, basically a split. I have the swarm traps are hanging on trees around my apiary. I do not put swarm traps around anybody else's apiaries because it's important for me that all my stock comes from the survivor wild stock. But because at my apiary this is uh, the only source of bees I ever had. Now I'm at 30 hives and all of them came uh, for free uh, through swarm traps. So I have swarm traps around the apiary and uh, right now looking out the window I see one of the swarm trap being investigated by um, scout bees. So for me a swarm is not a lost colony, it's rather a naturally multiplied colony. I will get uh, this swarm, not all of them, some of them had for the woods uh, which is fine for me. I am happy to repay the debt that I got and uh, give back uh, uh, to the wild population of bees what I originally took from them, so this is fine. But many of them do end up in my own swarm traps uh, and allowed me to build up the apiary from zero to more than 30 hives now in uh, just uh, three seasons. Uh, without uh, you know much effort devoted to it, uh, it is certainly not something I do full time, just as anyone else. Uh, I have many other interests and many other things to do. I'm raising a family of four children, so I was specifically uh, selecting a hive model that would allow me to keep bees while giving them the minimal amount of effort and time, and it works uh, real good. But as you asked me about the methods I use, ironically starting next season I do want to start to breed queens. I never thought I would get to that because uh, I thought, wow, wh why do it? Because swarms are plentiful and uh, of course raising queens is something that you cannot anymore term as natural beekeeping. But uh, I'm at the point where I realize that if we have this treasure of uh, uh, wild feral bees. This is such a valuable genetic resource that it would be wonderful for people who do not have wilderness outside their doorstep to still have access to these superior genetics because there, even the bees that were bred to resist the varroa mites, they, I do not think they would ever match the naturally bred bees that went through the natural selection in the middle of the forest. Uh, in their adaptation not only to overall but to the local climate, diseases and other conditions. So to um, propagate and promote this uh, very unique strain of bees who are so robust and resilient, I do want to start raising some queens starting next season. Uh, again, I would be doing it for the benefit of other beekeepers rather than for my own apiary because uh, I can really rely on swarm catching as a, uh, the only and very predictable way of growing my operation. Uh, over the course of the four years of uh, catching swarms here, I'm seeing that I am catching um, one swarm for every two or three swarm traps that I set out. Uh, so in a bad year, quote unquote bad year, I would catch three or four swarms or for every 10 swarm traps I set out. In a good year, uh, I would catch uh, a swarm in every other box that I set out. And there, even if you do not have the wild bees where you live, I still think that catching swarms is a wonderful way of starting and increasing your apiary because you have 
a colony that was propagated naturally. If you read uh, about how queens and bees are raised artificially, you realize, and today it's more and more widely understood, that the queen failure, even in the first year, is not so uncommon with the commercially available bees because there is a lot of stress on both the queen and the bees while they're being raised in the breeding apiaries. And then there is a lot of stress during the transport when they bring this queen uh, or the package of bees to you. You cannot control the temperatures, for example, um, that the bees will be subjected to during their uh, transfer. They can be somewhere in an airplane with very low temperatures. They can be overheating in a uh, van with uh, 100 degrees. So this is all detrimental to the fertility of the queen. This is why, unfortunately, many beekeepers who buy commercial queens see their bees, or their queens fail in the very first season. I'm not seeing anything like that, and I know I wouldn't be seeing it even if my swarms were coming from a managed apiary rather than from a, a, a feral colony, just because when you uh, get your local bees from your local forests or from your local apiaries, if they naturally swarmed, you know that you are getting the right proportion of nurse bees and forage bees, and you are also getting a queen that was naturally raised and fed on a diet of pollen and honey and delivered to you with a swarm, uh, avoiding all the dangers of uh, long-distance transport of the queens and of the bees. So it sounds like at this point you don't do any splitting, is that correct? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, and I'll tell you why. You know, when I first started, um, the motive really was to get the really natural honey. And for me, having grown up in Russia, it is the honey that comes from the brood comb rather than from the white pristine comb. Uh, in Russia, my uncle uh, has been selling this uh, white comb honey or extracted honey to others on the market but he would always keep the brood comb with pollen and uh, with honey in it. And this is what I grew up eating. And to me, it's much more satisfying. I really like the flavor. It's more like bread. Of course, it's called bee bread, uh, but uh, it's very rich. And uh, um, the honey that uh, is stored in uh, dark brood comb cells is uh, darker in color and has more intense flavor that I absolutely love. And of course, I was not finding this kind of calm honey in this country for the very simple reason that most beekeepers treat their brew chambers. So even if uh, this honey were available, it would not be fit for human consumption because of chemical contamination of the brew chambers. So I really wanted to start just a few hives uh, to provide this dark comb honey for myself and for my family. But I discovered that it is addictive. And uh, when you first get a few hives, it very quickly goes to 10 and 20 and 30 before you notice it because swarms are plentiful. And the example of my uncle, who's been keeping bees for 45 years now, both in horizontal and vertical hives, now that he is uh, uh, 77, he is transitioning to only horizontal hives because they're easier to manage and handle. But he's telling me that he cannot slow down either. He does it for his own family. And even though he doesn't treat, and yes, sometimes the colonies might not uh, make it through the winter, the swarms are plentiful. So now when a neighbor in his village comes and tells that there is a big swarm hanging on the apple tree and requests that he comes and collects it for free, his wife actually chases people away with the broom saying, leave the old man alone. He has too many bees as there it is. So now, uh, trying to slow down, he is still at 15 hives and their average is about 100 pounds of honey per hive. And he told me, Leo, you know what? For a family of two, that's sufficient. And I tend to agree because when I multiply 15 times 100, I can see how a family of two can really provide for their honey we, uh, needs with this uh, uh, treatment-free operation. 
I like that. It kind of gives a, a really a different feel. One of the problems, as I see it in this country, is that people are trying to keep bees the same way that commercial beekeepers keep bees. And the fact is that um, those of us and you that, that are mostly keeping it for doing it for fun, they're not keeping bees the same way as the commercial beekeepers are who are looking for profit in a business model. And so there's a whole, I mean, I mean, it's, it's almost a, an entirely different way of keeping bees in some respects because, you know, we're, we're, it's a labor of love rather than a paycheck. Uh, I totally agree, and Solomon, you you are totally correct. Is that the model that is presented as the only possible model for keeping bees is just one possibility? And you are right that it is more uh, geared towards commercial beekeepers. Even when you look at the hive design, why is it that Langstroth hives are uh, made today not the way Langstroth himself prescribed? Instead of double wall design, there is a single wall and the wall is fairly thin, just three quarters of an inch instead of thick plank that he himself advocated. Well, it, clearly this is for the ease of uh, hauling these hives around and moving them around in large quantities. Why is it that Langstroth hives do not have handles uh, on them that protrude like pieces of uh, one by one lumber serving as a handle. This would be much more easy to gra grab. Well, they have recessed uh, handles for the same reason. So you can uh, move them more easily and stack more colonies on a pallet to uh, load on a semi trailer to take to California for almond pollination, etc. So when you look at every aspect of beekeeping that's described in most of the beekeeping manuals, they promote the same model that may be appropriate for someone with 10,000 hives, but certainly becomes an overkill uh, for a small beekeeper. In the old books, if you open the books written in the 19th century, they were clearly seeing a distinction. There was a description of a traditional beekeeping, be it is in scaps or lock hives, where the beekeeper's uh, primary task was to give bees a swarm, uh, give them a good home, and then harvest honey once a year. And why should it be any more complicated than that for someone who just wants to have a few colonies uh, more for fun and for pollination and for having this buzz and this vibrating energy around you, but who doesn't have the pressure of making uh, his or her living off of the bees. Um, it doesn't make sense that you would be uh, utilizing the same methods that are really more appropriate for very large scale beekeepers. And actually, if you as a small backyard beekeeper wants to have more honey, then it actually is easy to add more hives and still harvest a small quantity per hive, then try to squeeze the maximum production from the hive. We know today that in the old times when people still had bees in uh, scaps or log hives or um, fixed calm box hives, even here in America, the average harvest of honey per colony was about 10 to 15 pounds per year. Today we'll say, oh, it's so little. But consider that this was the hive model and the hive uh, and beekeeping system that really required basically one visit per year just to harvest some surplus honey. So if you consider that you approach the hive once or maximum twice per year and you harvest 10 or 15 pounds per hive, then it still is a very viable viable model compared to harvesting 50 pounds from hive but having to constantly manipulate the bees and they're uh, trying to maximize honey production. And actually when you try to maximize honey production per hive, many times you compromise the integrity of the colony and they violate the natural principles on which your bees are built. Talking about swarming, uh, for most beekeepers, they are taught that swarming is something that is to be pre prevented if you want to have any honey production. 
And in a sense, this is correct because, of course, if you allow the swarm to be cast, uh, the production from this hive where will be significantly reduced this season. But uh, there are now experiments um, that confirm scientifically that colonies, even from conventional commercial stock, that are allowed to swarm naturally, they're um, healthier and they survive better without treatments um, than the same colonies of the same genetic background that are not allowed to swarm. The mechanism, it appears to be, uh, has to do with the break in the brood cycle. This is how bees in the wild cleanse themselves of varroa when the swarm departs, the fertile queen goes away with the swarm, the remaining virgin queen stays behind. It will be in a couple weeks before she matures, goes on the mating flight and starts uh, laying eggs. So for two or three weeks, there won't really be any significant amount of brood inside this hive, which will starve the varroa mites and many other um, pathogens and parasites to death because they require the brood to multiply themselves. So no brood in a swarming colony or in the swarm, uh, no varroa mites. And this is the cycle that repeats itself year after year, allowing the colonies to cleanse themselves without any help from us or from any treatments. So no matter how you look at it, the low put, simple beekeeping mm, approach is uh, a viable alternative and uh, actually I would say an alternative of choice for backyard beekeepers because not only it is simpler but also it makes it accessible to virtually everyone. It's one thing to invest uh, $150 in the hive and $150 in the bees that you get in a package and then in your beekeepers upkeep and it's quite another to put together a box uh, for five dollars or ten dollars in materials. Just connect on screws a few sheets of paper to make a swamp trap, put it on the tree and get started with the hive that is local, adapted to local conditions and didn't cost you that much to organize in the first place. So when you didn't spend hundreds of dollars on your beekeeping hobby, you feel less of a pressure to have any certain amount of uh, uh, honey production from this colony. You can really in, in, increase the number of hives while harvesting a smaller amount of uh, uh, honey per hive and still have a sufficient uh, quantity for yourself and to share and to maybe even sell the surplus. So all this can be done uh, without many of the complications of the large-scale commercial beekeeping. Couldn't agree more. Um, I just, I was having some thoughts here while you were talking. Um, one of the things with the thin walled hives that we have now, the, the so-called Langstroth hives, uh, again, based on the commercial model of beekeeping in this country. But if you think about it, virtually all commercial beekeepers overwinter their bees in the South. So, um, totally different conditions than I would say many if not most of hobbyist beekeepers keep their bees in because our uh, a lot of our population centers in this country are further north with with uh, more harsh winters especially if you look at um, the uh, the Great Lakes region the Northeast mm -hmm. um, and the Northwest where there are a huge number of people and where the conditions are significantly colder and, and more harsh in the winter especially than the south. Um, a lot of commercial beekeepers, of course, go to almonds in California. And a lot of large, the very largest commercial beekeepers are often located through, uh, through California, Texas, Alabama, Florida, and Georgia. Uh, this is true. And, you know, again, if you look up... Uh, uh, Langstroth's own uh, writings, he was emphasizing the importance of insulating the hives for the winter and building them of either very thick plank, what we would call today two by lumber, or uh, double walled with insulation. And there, 
uh, it really does make a difference. If you open the ABC and XYZ of B culture, the encyclopedia um, that is published by the root company, uh, and the root was the entrepreneur back in the 19th century who set up the mass scale, mass production of Langstroth hives. And he's the one who modified the Langstroth hive to make it thin walled and single wall uh, so it is cheap and they're uh, easy to afford to um, beekeepers so but you read even in their own uh, encyclopedia that they realized there uh, after they adopted the particular um, chamber size and box size and frame size they realized that it was too small for optimal overwintering and for successful development of the colony so the only reason why they um, switched over to two box uh, brood chamber consisting of two deeps is because they realized that the single deep frame was not big enough. And of course, if we look at how bees live in nature, they, they have comb that can be several feet deep inside the tree hollow. Of course, it's oriented vertically rather than horizontally. So they did have this realization, um, but already after tens of thousands of uh, hives were sold and the standard was established, so they uh, introduced the idea of uh, um, having a two-box uh, um, brood chamber, not because it is better for the bees, but because this is what they had to do with the setup that they adopted originally. Now, with the horizontal hive that uses the uh, traditional European deep frames that are 16 inches deep compared to 9 inches deep for a length trough, you are able to give your bees uninterrupted comb space. And there are many people who say, well, but what's the difference if I use two deep length trough bodies and what if I insulate them with some blue board nailed or screwed onto the hive in the fall? Uh, well, they will still have 18 inches uh, of uh, comb at their disposal. Yes, this is so, but uh, not to forget that in a vertical stacked length trough, there is a two inch gap between uh, comb in the lower chamber and in the upper box. And uh, in many harsh climates, be it in the mountains or in the north, um, many beekeepers lose their colonies, a sizable number of their stock during the winter just because they froze in the lower box and didn't move in the upper box because they were so sluggish and so cold. I've had, when that, they happen go up and, I've had that happen to me as well. Yes, you know, I taught my uh, natural beekeeping course, which is a two-day program that I offer around the country. I taught it in Seattle, Washington State, and there were people from British Columbia who attended. And I taught it at, uh, mm, in Bozeman, Montana, to Natural Beekeepers of Montana Club for two years now. And uh, mm, after some of these beekeepers adopted the horizontal hive with very deep frames that allow you to have the honey stored on the same very deep comb that is accessible to the bees without them having to bridge this gap between the boxes, and when they adopted the thicker wall, well-insulated hives, many of them were successful, even in Montana or British Columbia, to overwinter their bees successfully for the first time in their beekeeping careers. So the hive model certainly does matter. And uh, the farther north you go, the more critical it becomes for you to have a hive that's well-insulated and preferably uses the frame that is narrow and deep rather than long and shallow like the Langstroth frames because bees are adapted to moving up on the comb, consuming the reserves. So if you give them the size of the comb that is pretty much similar to what they would have in a tree hollow, then they would have no reason to uh, freeze in the winter. Mm -hmm. When I was in Montana, they took me hiking in the mountains and they showed me some feral colonies living in the mountains above Bozeman. And uh, I'm looking at these bees flying, and I ask them, what kind of temperatures do you have here in winter? 
And they say, well, this winter was not too bad. We had minus 40 for a week or two, and then it warmed up to minus 30. And I'm looking at these bees who are able to survive these harsh winters of Montana, somewhere in the crack in the rocks and the mountains, and who, according to the local people, have been there for as long as anybody can remember. And I realize that if your bees cannot survive in uh, your hives, in your climate, even if the climate is indeed very cold, then it's not the problem of the with the bees. Something is wrong with the way we keep them, uh, either with beekeeping methods or the hive model or both. This is why when I hear back from beekeepers who insulated their hives better and adopted frames that are uh, more uh, attuned to bees nature uh, and I see that they succeed much better than they used to with the conventional Langstroth frames I, I, I am very happy and uh, more and more people actually discover how fulfilling and simple it is to keep bees in horizontal highs with very deep frames in the northern climate and I know we only touch uh, a few topics here, but uh, Keeping Bees with a Smile is actually the most comprehensive book available on keeping bees naturally treatment free in horizontal hives with very deep frames. And uh, it's available on horizontalhive.com and uh, elsewhere on the internet. I was just remembering um, looking at looking at old pictures from old beekeeping books. You can find some of these on Michael Bush's website. Uh, you would see these yards with just dozens, maybe 50 or more hives, small hives. Whereas mm -hmm. nowadays, like with my hives that I keep much larger, I oftentimes can't keep more than uh, nine I usually do I, a lot of times I'll do like nine or 16 in a yard and, and that ends up being all that that ends up being all that, you know, uh, that area can handle. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, of course, it has to do with how we modify the landscape and how bountiful, uh, you know, fields and meadows and wild forests were a hundred years back or 200 years back. Actually, until 200 years ago, few people in America even kept bees because wild honey from the feral nests was, was so plentiful, people treated it as a free, inexhaustible resource. Mm. And you will read in history books that uh, men, instead of being beekeepers, that would they would take an axe and a saw and they would go in the forest and beeline uh, bees to their nest and they cut down the tree, open up the nest and uh, take their honey. Of course, this was destroying the colony, but uh, there was an impression that this resource just is limitless. A uh, hundred years later, when forests were logged and uh, meadows and natural prairies were converted to agriculture, Beekeeping became from some uh, from uh, a product of forestry, a separate occupation and a branch of uh, agriculture. And what you are saying that you know in the old times there literally there could be hundreds of hives positioned in one spot. And there is a wonderful book called The World History of uh, Beekeeping and Honey Hunting by Eva Crane, who created the International Beekeeping Research Association in UK. Uh, this is probably the most expensive beekeeping book I have, but it is worth it. It's $200, but it is large format and more than 700 pages packed with information. Can so I read this again? book. Uh -huh. The World History of uh, Beekeeping and Honey Hunting by Eva, E-V-A Crane. C-R-A-N-E. Uh, a wonderful resource that puts our today's beekeeping into perspective. You can see there how people kept bees in different parts of the world a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, three hundred years ago, even prehistorically. And what amazed me there is that she describes that in parts of Portugal uh, two or three hundred years ago, people were able to put 2,000 hives on the same spot and the bees had enough forage. 
it is just mind blowing. Imagine what how rich the ecosystem was and how many blooming plants there must have been at the time if you could get away with the putting a thousand hives or two thousand hives on the same spot and have enough nectar collected both for yourself and for the bees. Uh, but uh, another aspect of it, uh, you are right, is that in the old time the brood chambers were much smaller than we make them today. And there, yes, the large brood chamber, like say a double deep, when the queen can lay that many more eggs, uh, leads to a higher uh, bee population inside the hive, and the stronger hive will collect more honey. N nobody will dispute that. But at the same time, this creates more problems. The really big hives tend to swarm less, cleansing themselves of disease and parasites less, and there, the queen that lays at the top of her capacity uh, is has to be replaced more often than naturally. Why is it that in the 19th century, you read in the textbooks on beekeeping, that the queen can lay for two, three, four years, and in modern beekeeping books, uh, you read that preferably queens need to be replaced every year for maximum production. Well, partly this is because the queens today are forced to lay at the unnaturally high rate. And another aspect is when you have these huge brood chambers filled with brood, it is almost the same as having monoculture fields that become more susceptible to pest problems just because there is so much of this nice food for the pests all concentrated in one space. Tom Seeley, who um, I mentioned already, set up an experiment at Cornell University. This was a scientifically valid, very carefully designed and executed experiment when he put identical colonies coming from the same genetic stock with the sister queens that have the same genetics. He put 12 colonies in a single deep body, uh, which is actually the volume similar to the volume of the uh, wild nest somewhere in the woods and he did not expand these colonies allowing them to run out of room and start swarming but their volume was fixed at 40 liters or uh, 10 gallons the volume of one deep Langstroth body the other 12 colonies he put in uh, two bodies and then added a super on it so he kept them in an equivalent of three deep boxes and he compared their survival treatment three. And his results were that all of the colonies that were lodged in very larger high volume hives uh, died from varroa viruses and infestation within two years. But half of the same genetically uh, identical colonies that were placed into the small volume hives, they were still going without any treatments. And they're actually the most successful beekeeper, commercial beekeeper of the 19th century, uh, Moses Quinby. He was keeping his bees in small volume hives that didn't have any frames in it. And if you read there in his book, uh, published, uh, I believe, in 1853 originally, but you will read in his book that he considered uh, frame hives yes to be able to produce more honey but still a quite different model of the beekeeping he was saying that with the small hives it becomes a self-sustaining system because they will swarm you catch the swarms you have more hives you have more bees and still you will have sizable honey production without having to go beyond these natural limits and there uh, i very much am in enjoying seeing that even today 150 years later, even with all the pest and parasite and disease problems and environmental problems that we and the bees are facing, this all-time approach to natural beekeeping is still possible. How would you suggest um, that people either wanting to move over from Langstroth hives to, what was the name of it, Layens hive? Um, a Lang's hive. Yeah. How would you suggest the people who want to move over from Lang's or want to start out f from the beginning, what vital steps would you suggest that 
these people should um, take, look into, things that they should read, uh, how, how to get started with this type of mm -hmm. hive? Yes, thank you, Solomon. I think that the first thing is to make the change slowly. Do not jump on it just because it works for me. Every climate is different and bees are different. And uh, what I would do if you have already bees in a Langstroth hive and if you want to experiment and to see whether the horizontal hive beekeeping uh, appeals to you, is to build a horizontal hive that accepts the kind of the frames you already use. For example, if you have uh, um, boxes with deep Langstroth frames, just cut a piece of 2 by 10 board into four pieces, connect it on screws, and you'll have a long box uh, to accept the same size of the frame you already utilize. And let your bees live there for a year. And then comparing them to your setup you already have, you may be able to make your own choice of whether you want to move more in this direction. Um, I do not regret going horizontal uh, at all. I do not plan to move my hives. Uh, I know I'm producing less honey this way because I'm not taking them to clover fields and then to blueberry orchards and other operations where bees can g gather really, really large volumes of uh, nectar very quickly. But also I know that the quality of the honey that I have is much superior because instead of coming from one floral source, it comes from the nectar of hundreds of different species of wild growing plants here in the middle of the Ozark forest. So because I do not plan to move my hives, I can make them out of uh, thick lumber for the benefit of the bees. And again, if you already have the bees, build a hive that accepts your frames that you already have. If you are in a very cold climate, however, I would not really recommend a single deep Langstroth horizontal hive because it is uh, longish. It can be between 20 and 30 frames. And uh, bees will not have enough room for overwintering successfully on this frame and moving horizontally from one frame to another is not something they can do successfully in the very cold climate. There I would really recommend trying the layens frame and I, as I mentioned some beekeepers who had been trying to keep their colonies on Langstroth frames for many years they would lose all their bees in the winter and buy new packages in the spring. Uh, some of them, after building the layens hives, and free plans for building these are available on horizontalhive.com. If you are not a woodworker and do not have a local craftsman who could make these hives for you, um, I also sell the hives that are ready to go, so you can order one and put your bees in there, either a natural swarm or even a package of bees. Um, I certainly do recommend to beginners who do not have any bees at all to build their swarm traps. Swarm traps are very simple plywood boxes that cost less than $15 in materials to put together. And uh, I can make eight in a single day, so approximately one hour of your time. If you have very simple uh, uh, woodworking tools like a table saw, but even without a table saw, if you have a circular saw and a screwdriver, you can put one together. So, and position these uh, swamp traps, uh, preferably away from anybody else's apiary in the wilderness, and start with catching your local bees, because I think that the future of sustainable beekeeping has to start with local bees in the first place and then transfer them into the hive of your choice. So, to answer your question, uh, if you are in a southern climate, like I would say Missouri or farther south, yes, you can keep bees successful in horizontal hives uh, on conventional Langstroth frames. So, just build yourself one box that will cost you less than $35 in material, uh, plus a few hours of your time and there transfer one colony from your existing hive into a horizontal hive simply by taking all the frames uh, from your existing boxes and putting them in the same arrangement in one long box. Uh, if you are farther north, I would not recommend um, relatively shallow 
Langstroth style horizontal hives, you do need to go with a deeper frame. You know, people might ask, well, but what's the difference? They can still move horizontally on the frame uh, consuming honey. Well, yes, but the volume of the frame is different. The Lyons frame is 30% larger than uh, Langstroth frame, so it can hold 30% more uh, wintering food for the bees. But as importantly, when the frame is narrow, like 12 inches narrow and 16 inches deep, it's easier for the bees to heat this volume compared to the long and shallow Langstroth frame. So they can uh, heat this volume more efficiently like they would in a tree hollow. And finally, when the cluster is at the bottom of the very deep frame, like 16 inches, and they have honey stored on top of them, the warmth of the cluster rises and preheats and warms up this honey that will then be consumed. So when the cluster moves up consuming honey, they are already consuming honey that is uh, uh, fairly warm in temperature. And this natural effect is lost when they have to move horizontally on a Langstroth frame because nothing is preheating the uh, honey that is positioned to the right or the left uh, of the cluster. So they lose more energy this way. So anyway, for all these reasons, sir, uh, I would encourage those who are in the north to try the very deep frame. And their free plans are available on uh, horizontalhive.com and extensive information on managing these hives is uh, available in the book Keeping Bees with a Smile, uh, the vision and practice of natural apiculture. All right, is there anything else you'd like to tell us before we wrap yes, it up? Yes, I'd like to mention, yes, thank you, Solomon. I'd like to mention that I uh, uh, teacher very popular natural beekeeping classes that go into all the details of the natural approach um, and there we spend two days together at my apiary looking at all the hives and they're really visualizing what would be the best hive for each particular person depending on where they come from and what their interests are it's not like I'm promoting the horizontal hive model as the only possible way of keeping bees. Of course, this is not true, but I see that uh, it can be very advantageous to uh, smaller scale beekeepers or, and especially in the northern climates or those who do not even physically have the strength to handle uh, the Langstroth boxes. Actually, I don't think even those who do have and the strength to lift a 50-pound box or from a Langstroth hive full of honey, I don't think it is very helpful anyway. As my friend, the beekeeper in upstate Michigan, who's been using horizontal hives even before anyone heard about uh, top bar hives in this country, he's been using horizontal hives on a commercial scale, producing comb cut honey uh, for 20 years. So he joked that all the money he had made during his commercial beekeeping career as a Langstroth hive beekeeper. He then had to spend on back and knee replacement surgeries <laughs> after he was 65. And it's a very sad joke because he's gone through that. Yeah. So anyway, uh, uh, you can uh, read all the basics of this very simplified and mainstream uh, there hive management and keeping bees with a smile. And I teach these natural beekeeping courses that attract people not only from all over uh, the country, but also internationally. There are sometimes people who come from Canada or even as far as Europe just to attend this class. And there, the next one will take place in Missouri at my apiary on October 22nd and 23rd, 2016. And you can find all the details on horizontalhive.com. Finally, I'd like to mention that uh, horizontal hives can be really a lot of fun. I made one of the hives uh, getting the idea from Eastern European beekeepers in Slovenia and Ukraine and Russia. I made one long horizontal hive that's actually long enough for you to sleep on. And this is quite a special experience that you can read about in my uh, article in the American Bee Journal, uh, September or November 2015 issue, and also on the website horizontalhive.com. 
there are free plans to build your own what I call B bed or B and B. Uh, it's a horizontal <laughs> hive where you l l lie down upon the frames. Of course, you are separated by cover boards or that are three quarter inch thick, but it is a very remarkable experience, sir. That is as relaxing as a sauna. It, you will have a good sweat because the bees inside the box generate a lot of heat in the summer. Actually, enough heat for you to break a sweat like in a sauna, but. Uh, it's not the exhausting heat of the sauna because uh, it is uh, uh, not as intense. Another thing is that they vibrate, they um, evaporate all the nectar they brought in, so fanning their wings is so uh, intense when you have a large hive in the summertime that this vibration is palpable. You can put the palms of your hand there on this bee bed and you can feel the vibration coming through the boards. So when you lie down, your body is being gently massaged at the same time as uh, it is being warmed up. And uh, finally, you can hear this buzz, which is similar to sleeping by a brook, extremely relaxing. And you get the smell of propolis and nectar and honey and wax and the bee colony uh, enveloping you. So for those of you who are... Um, you know, into exploring all the different possibilities and the dimensions of uh, beekeeping, I can really highly recommend uh, building yourself uh, a horizontal hive that's big enough for you to lie on and experience the bee bed uh, therapy. So again, the free plans are horizontalhive.com. And many more things are coming, so if you are interested in what uh, I'm talking about, I have a free um, a newsletter, you can sign up on the website, horizontalhive.com. I never spam, I only send the two or three emails per year, but they're full of r practical or valuable information on keeping your bees naturally, either in horizontal hives or in vertical hives. And I thank you, Salman, and thank all the listeners for your attention and for having me on this podcast. Dr. Leo Shereshkin, thank you. You're welcome. I want to give a special thank you to my patrons at patreon.com. I now have 20 people supporting the podcast. Um, if you do the math, that's about one person per hundred listeners. So I guess that's pretty good. All right. So that's the end of the show. Uh, if you want to support the podcast, you can support it at patreon.com slash TFB. Uh, our main forum is at Facebook at the uh, Treatment Free Beekeepers group. And I also now have a Southern Oregon Treatment Free Beekeepers group on Facebook. So if you are in the Southern Oregon or Northern California area or anywhere that you want to drive to Medford or Grants Pass or somewhere in this area and you want to be part of that group, we are starting that with uh, a couple of us locals here trying to start a community that's more in line with treatment-free beekeeping principles. So check that out. We also have a forum. It's at forum.tfbees.net. T-F-B-E-E-S. B -E -E -S, T-F-B-E-E-S. And, of course, the podcast you can find. If you have not yet subscribed to this podcast, maybe you're just listening to it on the Internet, you can find it at uh, tfb.podbean.com. Go ahead and subscribe there. If you could take a few minutes and go over and find it on iTunes and leave me a review, good, bad, or otherwise, good, preferred, uh, that'd be really awesome. I'm told that it helps other people find the podcast. Well, that's all I have for today. It's kind of an overcast day here in usually sunny southern Oregon. Um, so have fun keeping bees because if you're not having fun, you probably shouldn't be doing it. <laughs>